Chris Warren passed away a couple months ago. I know it was a shock to everybody here. It was a shock to the entire comic book world. And of course, it was a shock to me because when Kurt Swan passed away, I feel like in a way, Superman passed away as well. But what I want to talk about tonight is the fact that not that Kurt Swan died, but that he brought Superman to life in a way that no other artist has ever done before. Let's give a couple minutes for everybody to arrange themselves a little bit. Okay. This is me, I was six years old in 1963, in summer camp, and there's a comic book down on my legs there, and that comic book happens to be the Superman Annual from 1963, with incredible portraits of Superman as a silver statue. And uh, this comic meant a lot to me. It was one of the first comics I can remember seeing, and like many baby boomers from this generation, it was Kurt Superman that was the Superman that they grew up with. And the stories from that time were stories that, to this day, have a resonance among fans from this multiple 1963 stories that Kurt drew that affected us tremendously. These were one of the imaginary stories, Superman Red, Superman Blue. The death of Superman was another imaginary story, and that's the first thing I thought of when Kurt Swan passed away. I thought, well, yes, it was a waste. It was like Superman was dying. I remember this final panel that Kurt drew with Superman as a ghostly figure in the clouds. And I remember crying when I read this story with the writing that the strongest and finest most powerful human being I've ever known, my cousin Superman. It was images like this that resonated with an entire generation. Kurt Superman also took the origins of Superman and the basic facets of Superman's whole kind of story, his legend, and made them live and made them very iconic in a way. Everything from the birth of Superman, jor on the planet, all the scenes that Kurt drew had a symbolic this, and they were like very simple to what Superman was about. The stuff that Kurt drew are the elements of the Superman mythos that to this day are such a major part of Superman, and these are the images that Kurt Swan drew. He drew the debut of Supergirl. He drew the debut of the Fortress of Solitude. But not only did Kurt make his artwork convincing, not only did he make it seem as if Superman could hold that giant key effortlessly, but Kurt was also able to draw a very human Superman, a Superman that could struggle. And this is something that we'll return to over and over again in Kurt's work. But for me and for many others, it was the Kurt Swan Superman in images like this has stood the test of time and continued to be the Superman. Sure, there were the Superman figures before. This was Wayne Boring. This was in the 1950s, or the late 40s. This is, I believe, Fred Ray drawing in the original Joe Schuster style. The current Superman can stand up to any of these. If we go back to the very original Schuster Superman breaking the chains, and we see how this image was continued over the years. Again, Fred Ray a couple of years later. But here's Kurt's contribution to the famous Superman first in the, uh, the chains. And this is just as beautiful and just as iconic as those others. The way more Superman that preceded Kurt's was more barrel chested. This was the more the late 40s, 1950s idea of a super strong man. Whereas Kurt's Superman was, had much more human realistic proportions. And in many ways, Kurt. Swan has to be looked at as one of the first really realistic superhero comic artists in this period. Here's the Wayne Morris Superman. Here's Kurt Superman. You can see kind of the more human proportions and the thoughtfulness in this face, the humanity in that face. Wayne Morris Superman would fly out a window in some kind of rear parallel with the ground kind of posture. Now, Kurt Superman, he the right way. <laughs> Here's the way Morris Superman. And not to take away from the way Morris Superman, but I'll take that first swan flying pose as the classic Superman flying pose. And it's this pose that, in a way, 
That's become the gospel of Superman. That foreign pose, that first one, innovated. It's still the Superman pose. It's the Superman pose that Andy Warhol used when he made this print that Jen is going to stand the test of time. Chris Warren drew the model sheet of Superman every time he drew Superman. This is the actual model sheet that he drew. Here's his Superman proportions. Here's his Clark Kent proportions. His Clark Kent is again a classic Clark Kent with that wink in the eye that we all know and all love in a way. All of the Superman family that Chris Wan drew were classic representations, but as you can see in this image, it's also the humanity, the, the realism of the emotions. They weren't just cardboard comic characters like other artists were drawing at the time. Lois Lane, Jimmy Olsen, you can see the humanity on his face. Jimmy Olsen in particular was a character that Chris Wan drew a lot, and here again, he's not just some cardboard character. You can see the emotion and the realism in his face. Of course, when you're talking about Jimmy Olsen, you also have these classic images that first went through the 60s that have to rank along with the bizarre world some of the kind of campiest images, something about. And, you know, I think it was the way Kurt drew these things. He drew them very realistically and very literally, but the outrageousness of the situation and the fact that Kurt drew them without batting an eye is, I think, what made images like this still resonate today. But again, the more serious stuff that Kurt Swan drew are, again, our classic Superman stories where here, him and Jimmy Olsen are kind of like a Batman and Robin of the Bob City of Kandor. These were classic stories, and Kurt drew them beautifully. Speaking of Batman and Robin, in addition to drawing Superman, Kurt drew a beautiful Batman and Robin, and he drew them in World's Finest Comics where they teamed up. One of the great stories, one of the classic, iconic DC Comics historical stories, is the story of the composite Superman, a classic children's wish fulfillment. What if Superman and Batman were combined together in one person? Well, Kurt pulled it off. In this story, which has very kind of weird symbolism to it, this character not only has the powers of Superman and Batman, but has the powers of the entire legion of superheroes. Um, in this story, at the end, Superman meets this composite Superman in this sort of symbolic throne room. There's something about this image that to this day still has a surrealism to it that a lot of the other stories that Kurt Drew didn't have. And part of what made it surreal were images like this, in which the composite Superman Batman wants to control the world, and in a kind of very literal way, literally holding the world. And images that Kurt Drew seem to, again, there seems to be this running theme of Superman as a statue holding up the world. And images of Superman of the world is, again, coming from the death of Superman. As a kid, when you read these stories and saw these images, they did something to you that to this day, anybody that read those stories can remember these very quiet, very strong images of statues and, and in a way, death. Kurt Swan drew the Legion of Superheroes, and one of the most famous stories was the death of the Pharaoh lad. And again, Kurt Swan drawing these images of, of death, the death of heroes, is something that not many artists could pull off. The fact that he would draw these memorials and statues and grave sites. There was a quiet grace to Kurt's work when he would do images like this that I think lent a kind of literalness to the name Kurt Swan. There was a swan-like grace to Kurt's work that was most found in these kind of quiet, melancholy images of grave sites and stones and statues that he returned to time and time again. This is from the later period. And again, Kurt's figures were realistic, but they had a grace and a stature that especially when drawn as these statues, as these large and light images, had a character to them. No matter what the figures were doing, there was this grace and this beauty to them and this quiet solitude to these figures. 
There's something that, again, not many artists could pull off on this. There was a time in the late 60s when Carla Infantino, great artist of BC Silver Age, became the editorial director and eventually publisher, and he brought in a kind of a new artistic slant to DC Comics in the late 60s, and one of the things that he did for Kurt's work by feeling the pressure of Marvel Comics was to get DC Silver Age artists to kind of reach into themselves and pull out more dynamic work out of them. And Kurt started to produce work that measured up to this demand. This cover appeared only two months after this famous cover appeared, and I believe as famous as this cover is by John Romita, that Kurt's cover equally is the same type of power and grace. Kurt's layouts during this time, thanks to Infantino's urging, started to break out of the six pounds per page format and became a lot bolder and a lot more exciting. Here he is in this period when things really changed a couple years later was when editor Julia Schwartz teamed Kurt up with the great Silver Age inker Murphy Anderson on Superman in 1971. They debuted their work together in this comic with a cover by Neil Adams. But inside, there were a couple of sequences that, again, anybody that read these comics might remember, where they tried to destroy Kryptonite, and Kurt was able to draw a sequence and classic Superman facial expressions that only Kurt could draw. The idea that Superman was now done with Kryptonite forever. There was another sequence in that first issue that, again, has resonance years later, in which the sand creature begins to come up and arise out of the sand. And again, with the inks of Murphy Anderson just aiding the beautiful figure work of Kurt Swan, I mean, you can look at anybody's realistic figure work in these images, and you feel the weight of this character, you feel the weight of that cape, you sense the figure underneath it, and that's the magnificence of Kurt's realistic anatomy. That's the final panel of that sequence. Again, before Murphy Anderson came along, before Infantino urged Kurt to become kind of more dynamic, the Superman figure flying pose was this, inked by George Klein, great inker. But once... We got another little jump. There we go. We start to get from Kurt during this period of Murphy Anderson much more dynamic flying poses and much more dynamic imagery. We started to see Kurt draw Superman's vantage points from much more dynamic angles, and the work, this whole work, just took a whole other leap. Classic scenes of Superman changing took on a new dynamism with Murphy Anderson's ace. Splash pages, again, coming up with new dynamic ways to show the same scenes. This is something where Kurt just it settled beyond, beyond anybody's expectations. His page layouts became as dynamic as any of the great artists that have graced on the art. This being one great splash page. This one from that first uh, sequence with Burke Anderson's he dealt with it. It's beautiful and it's power. But again, the grace of the figures is still there. And Underneath all of those dynamics was still the great Kurt Swan facial expressions made to Superman, only aided now by Murphy Anderson's wonderful things, just made Superman even more real and more human than ever before. Kurt Swan could make Superman cry and make you believe it. Superman in poses like this, the humanity of this pose, the naturalness of it, the grace of it. Again, the Murphy Anderson's face were just beautiful. Here, towards the end of Superman's, of uh, Kurt's Superman uh, drawing career, we can all shed a tear what Superman's doing now for Kurt. That panel came from this issue, published about 10 years ago. One of Kurt's last Superman drawings. There was a self-portrait Kurt did not too long ago. I'm not sure when this dates from. But here he is at his drawing board. Kind of seeing there, you can see Superman and Jimmy Olsen, Batman, the Legion of Superheroes. 
some of the characters I've heard through over the years. That's my finger on a business card with Kurt Swan's handwriting and phone number. I was lucky enough to meet Kurt a couple of years ago at one of these National Cartoon Society get-togethers. And needless to say, it was a big thrill meeting my first favorite artist. And I told him that all those years, DC Comics never gave artists credit. I didn't know who you were. But to meet him in person was such a thrill and such a pleasure. And I told him about how this being a postcard I grew when I was seven years old in summer camp sent to my mother. And this basically comes from Kurt's drawings. This is what Kurt Swan's Superman meant to me and meant to an entire generation. And how I took this famous Kurt Swan cover of Superman showing Supergirl to the world and how I used it as a basis for my wedding invitation where my wife and I got married and because we're both comic artists doing comic art, we had to do a comic book art style invitation. And we've since gone on to do comic book art for advertising, calling ourselves a dynamic duo studio. But somewhere in all those figures and all those drawings, I try to get the grace of Kurt Swan's figure work in my figure work, and that's what I try to tell her. I'm trying to teach a course at the School of Visual Arts on 20th Century Comic Art, and I am going to try to make sure that if I get to teach that course, that Kurt's work becomes a featured part of the 20th Century Comic Art. And for what Kurt's work meant to me, I found a quote by Albert Camus that makes a lot of sense. I want to read it to you now. A man's work is nothing but the slow trek to rediscover through the detours of art those two or three great but simple images in whose presence his heart first opened. 